Hi, everybody, and welcome to Outward, Slate's LGBTQ podcast and lending library, where no books are banned, but you should still be very careful because they're as likely to read you as you are them. Oh. I'm Brian Lauder. My job is to edit some of Slate to host this program and to make bad jokes at the top of it. That is why <laughs> <laughs> that is why it is a relief to have my co-host Jules Gil Peterson back in the house to save you from hey. me. Jules, how are you, darling? Oh my goodness, I'm good. I'm happy to be back. I am no stranger to reading uh, <laughs> or writing. I am a stranger to arithmetic. To arithmetic, same. That's, that's that's probably not a shocking revelation about me. I think that's like, yeah. uh, well, I shouldn't say it's a queer deficit, but there's a lot of us that can't do the adding and subtracting, I feel like. <laughs> at least in my... <laughs> Queer mathematicians write in and yell, it's fine. So on this week's show, we're really honored to be joined by one of the most important queer legal minds working today. You almost certainly know Chase Strangio, a lawyer and advocate with the ACLU, who is and has been working overtime for years alongside many other legal folks to fight back against the deluge of anti-trans and broader LGBTQ legislation that we're seeing in this country. Now that we're into the third month of 2024, we wanted to have Chase on to discuss the sorts of attacks happening in state legislatures and and federal government also across the U.S. And spoiler, they are hellishly numerous and varied. And to hear about how he and his colleagues are fighting back, where we're winning and losing ground, and how we can all help. Along with that, we'll have your updates to the gay agenda and our usual round of prides and provocations. But first, it's time for thoughts and queries, because we have a particularly strong thought that we are overdue in addressing about all of us strangers. (laughs) Jules, are you ready to have this conversation? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Fine, I'll be the bigger woman. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read a note that we got from, and we got a few notes about this, about our, our All of the Strangers episode from a few weeks ago. But I'm just going to read one note that I thought was really thorough and thoughtful from listener Jeff uh, that, that sort of explains uh, a critique that, that we got. Hey, y'all, just finished listening to your uh, glib, savage takedown of all of us strangers. And I got to say, keeping in mind that I'm older, 50-something says white guy, white gay guy, rather, I gasped harder and louder and not in a sexy way at the collective sneers that you dished out than I did at the sixth sensiness of the film. I don't want to be an angry old gay shaking my fist and shouting get off my lawn at the poly non-binary rainbow unicorn children who have all their shit sorted out and clearly prefer Marvel movies to thoughtful fair. <laughs> oh, but I mean, come on, y'all spent a lot of airtime dismissing the trauma of cis gay elders. I didn't love the film, but I absolutely resonate with the tone that Andrew Hay takes in his work about gay men and trauma and depression. There are still a lot of wounded, damaged, deeply traumatized queer elders in the world. And again, at the risk of sounding like an old, the old gay that I am, that shit was and is very real. A lot of folk don't come back from processing the decades they opted not to fuck or being cast out of their families of origin or helping in the fights for healthcare and rights and systemic change only to wind up in the shithole of the current world and think (laughs) we fought for this. And I know you know that. In the spirit of generosity, I mostly brush off your razor digs at the language and process of therapy in Hayes film work as attempts to be funny about a movie you didn't love. But color me a listener who thought you all came off sounding needlessly mean and deliberately obtuse. As a viewer of the film, the trauma processing didn't throw me a bit. It felt accurate and akin to the lives of a lot of gay men in, mid- in midlife that I know now. He goes on, but uh, I'll I'll skip ahead a little bit. Anyways, like I said, not my favorite film, but Slings and Arrows hurt this particular listener who is a late-in-life undergrad, sexuality, gender, and queer studies major, and a big fan of Jules' academic writings. Maybe I just need a thicker skin. Um, I thought that was worth addressing quickly just because I'll have to admit, Jules, that after we finished, right after we finished recording that episode, I felt like we'd been a little too mean. I had this like sense walking out of the room, oh. like, oh, I don't know, like, or maybe was I like over caffeinated? Like, did I, did, did we come on a little too strong? <laughs> um, and I just want to say, I want to hear what you have to say too, but I, but I just want to quickly say for me, um, I did want to convey that I thought it was a sweet movie in many ways, had a clear sort of heart and sense of melancholy that, that did tug at me. Um, it was just that the framing, that sixth sense framing that he mentions and the sort of turning of, I don't know, therapy like into art, like didn't work for me. But I didn't mean to dismiss like a whole group of people's trauma. Um, and so I'm kind of grateful for to Jeff for that pushback. What do, what do you have to say back to Jeff? 
I'll say this. I'm 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 willing to be mean about cultural interpretation because these are like fictional stories mm, and representation, mm, right? Yeah. Um I wouldn't I wouldn't do that if it was like someone, you know, I don't know, testifying to their own personal life. Uh, but I actually really appreciate that that Jeff like came came back w- with some energy at us. Mm-hmm, you know, I'm like this is mm-hmm. the kind of thought and query, like, yeah, come for us, baby. Like, I think one of the funny things about that episode was like it's not always the case, but it seemed like all three of us pretty much agreed on the film. Um, and it's like, we don't discuss that in advance. So it's yeah, sort of like, yeah, it's fresh. Yeah. It meant it was sort of like, we we're just moving all in the same direction. But, you know, I think one of the things that's sort of interesting to be a and thoughtful in that comment is in fact the way like that you know even if you didn't really like the film that there's something really captivating about the way that media today has this burden of representing people's experiences Mm -hmm. like really Mm -hmm. specific generational and historical experiences and that that's become such um such a primary rubric for evaluating fiction is is really that really stands out to me and i think that is actually part of the reason why these things touch strong nerves right and why um irreverence or playfulness can can actually feel really intense sometimes so so i really appreciate yeah jeff sort of yeah. uh, taking the time to 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 be real with us, uh, but also to to testify a little bit to why it actually matters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually something that I think the film itself is an opportunity for for us all to reflect on. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I do too. Thank you so much, Jeff. And just a reminder for listeners: if you have a thought, spicy or otherwise, or a query or an advice question for us, please let us know at outwardpodcastslate dot com. Um, as always, we love to hear voices if we can so voice memos are really appreciated but uh also emails are perfectly fine again outward podcast at slate.com and we are back uh, with our always delightful uh sets of prides and provocations so brian do you want to kick us off how how are you feeling there are only two choices <laughs> there's only two choices uh <laughs> i i am feeling provoked oh i'm feeling provoked oh my god uh, i'm ready for it so i'm provoked by feud capote versus the swans uh i don't know if you've been watching this jules um i know but it seems provocative it's provocative people talking about it yeah i ooh. I, so the reason you know it's been on for a while, but I realized that this episode of the podcast is actually going to drop on the same day as the finale. So I felt like it would be good for me to be present, sort of an audio spirit to, to process just how awful this show was. Because finally, I watched it all on screeners as we get to do as press a long time ago. Um, and now the rest of the public is sort of getting to see it as it actually rolled out, right? So terrible show. Look, Period details were pretty. It was fun to yeah. see those actresses come together at, at a restaurant all the time for brunch. Tom Hollander, I think, did a pretty good Capote impression. Jessica Lang was like a ghost. It, that, like, that stuff was fun. But I cannot get over how the queer creative folks behind the show, which is Ryan Murphy was producing, Gus Van Sant was a principal director, oh. and John Robin Bates is the writer and showrunner. So great, you know, important people. Yeah clearly despised this main subject, Capote. Clearly yeah. hated yeah. this man. Uh, it bothered me so much, Jules, that I wrote a whole, like, 1,500-word rant about it in Slate that if people want to go read, why does Feud hate Truman Capote so much? This is like Well I, worth the read, I will. Oh, my yeah. God. There's a lot of detail in that, but the short version is that in a show about a really complicated guy who was in some ways a mess and in some ways very brilliant... We only see the mess, the alcohol and drug use issues in particular, and it just goes on and on, episode after episode, smashing Capote into the ground before he finally dies. And by the time he dies, you're just like, thank God, like, let's leave this man alone. And in the finale, which I can finally sort of, because of spoilers, like, scream about now, (laughs) they literally sell his ashes at an auction while the ghost swans stand in the back, like, tut-tutting, and then go off to lunch together. And Capote doesn't even get to come. Everybody else gets to be a ghost. And he's just what? dead dead in the box, like ashes he, in the box. He can't even front, get ghosted. He can't even get ghosted. <laughs> ghosted in that way. No, every one gets redeemed but him. It's so comically cruel, unnecessary. I don't know why the show was made. 
The feud is not between Caperdi and the Swans. It's between the creators and Caperdi. And I have to say, like, a lot of recent Ryan Murphy-produced things, it's got this scoldy, moralizing thing going on that has just become a drag. And it's really it's really a shame, because I, I used to like some of his stuff, early American Horror Story, I thought was really great. This This stuff is just boring and a drag. High hopes for it because feud the first feud with Betty Davis and and Joan Crawford. It was really, so good. I liked a lot, right? Yeah. But but this was ghastly, ghastly, ghastly. So very very provoked and glad for Capote's sake, uh, the real one that it's over. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, wow! wow. It, it, honestly, I haven't watched it for that reason. Like I actually, yeah. I really have a, a certain attachment to Truman Capote as as a kind of mid century faggot. Um, yeah, the kinds yeah. of which is like frankly, illegal in today's gay culture. <laughs> God forbid anyone be that witty uh, and in- and incisive and also fucked up, which, hey, guess what? They go together. You yeah. have to be a saint yeah. to be a publicly recognized gay person. But anyways, yeah. ay, ay, ay. <laughs> ay, well, ay, ay. how unfair, because the guy was nothing if not a brilliant writer. So it's it's yes. very unfair to see him done dirty this way by, by writing. Yeah, no, exactly. Mm. Whew. Okay, Jules, what do you have for us? <laughs> okay, well, I'm proud, but it's also pretty catty. So. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to get some more thoughts and queries. But um, all right. I, I actually, I'm proud. Um, or I experienced pride reading Saeed Jones's uh, book review of RuPaul's mm, and, um, mm-hmm, in the New York Times, mm-hmm. which came out very recently. <laughs> um, you know, RuPaul has another memoir out called The House of Hidden Meanings. <laughs> Interesting title there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of RuPaul, you know, it's whatever, take away my gay card. I tried watching it when I used to be a gay boy, and now I'm, you know, like, sort of just one of those trans women who's like, I don't know, I've evolved beyond the need for RuPaul's Drag Race. But anyways, that's a separate <laughs> conversation. Um, no, I mean, what Jones gets into, you know, I obviously haven't read the memoir yet, but, you know, you know, RuPaul's sort of quintessential kind of new age, um, you know, philosophy mm-hmm, that like mm-hmm. your job in life is to cultivate yourself into some sort of Zen um, self-affirmation. Uh, and apparently that just comes through in very odd ways in the memoir. So I, I'm going to give Jones the floor here because this is not, you know, it's, it's, it's what Saeed Jones had to say that I'm proud of. So Jones writes... I wearily recalled an earlier section of the book while kind of getting into what it's about. Explaining the conservative environment of his childhood in San Diego, RuPaul summarizes the Great Migration in a Mm. paragraph that would be considered too concise even for a Wikipedia entry, (laughs) then declares, and this is quoting the memoir, quote, All the Black people in our neighborhood were transplants from the South, and so they had inherited a kind of slave mentality which was based on fear, end quote. Jones continues, Aside from the breathtaking dismissiveness of the decades of racial violence that made the migration necessary, it's chilling to see a public figure known as a champion of the marginalized so easily dismiss survivors of Jim Crow era terror as people who, quote, hold on to their victim mentality so fiercely it becomes a defining feature of their identity. Says Jones, The way we tell our stories has a way of telling on us. The memoir reveals an author who thinks he understands outsiders when really all he understands is that he wanted to become famous and eventually became famous. Mm, That line. First of all, I appreciate a good book review, so thank you. Um, But 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 part of what that I wanted to say, you know, is like I appreciate someone, you know, drawing attention to that. You know, it's it's in moments like that where this kind of. um, You know, Hollywood New Age um, kind of personal psychic consultant kind of speak that's very popular today. Yes. You know, kind of broadly culturally, but is obviously associated with celebrities, you know, really falls flat and obviously just reveals how empty and vacuous it is and how it's so much about elevating the individual over everything else and sort of taking care of yourself um, as like the ultimate like islander product that you have to like sort of affirm in the world. And, you know, part of what I just wanted to think about and what made me feel proud is I I really have come to understand in some ways that the sort of rise of queer culture as a kind of, you know, a culture of broad appeal Mm, in the middle class and entertainment industry actually really does 
I'm doing research on this, come out of a history of new age and, and of self-help cultures and therapeutic cultures. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. which like uh-huh. all Americans were into in the in the 70s and the 80s, 80s and the 90s. Yeah. But I just think like so often because queer and trans culture is valued for claiming that it celebrates like radical difference or marginality and that it really much goes against like the mainstream. And so often I think that that's not actually true. That's yeah. actually just like a marketing line. Mm-hmm. Um, I-, I think in many ways RuPaul's career is a great example, right? Where how like actually someone, you know, who's had a long and impressive career, you know, is sort of gets to cash in on this particular way of styling the self as if it were more much more insightful than it really is. And that's like not really a particular read on RuPaul. It's just sort of like in the same way that we don't really believe that Gwyneth Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop are like actually providing (laughs) a concrete alternative to the fact that we don't have like real health care in this country. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, of course, RuPaul's brand of drag and understanding of self-affirmation as meaningful is exactly the kind of thing you would do in a country where people don't have the resources they need to live well and Mm -hmm. don't actually have... Um, you know, any of the the agency delegated to them to steer the sh- the ship of the course of their lives, right? And so, yeah. you know, ultimately, it makes me proud because I think these are hard conversations to have right now. So people feel very defensive when we're all under attack politically. But I'm like, yeah, you know, just in the same way that that RuPaul's reflection <laughs> on the Great Migration yeah. Yeah. has nothing Wild. to say about the political struggle for Black freedom. I just think that sort of broader way that queer culture is just a new age culture uh, and self help culture is just kind of like i think i think i think we can let go of that y'all mm, i think it's time for mm. something new and i would celebrate that so you yeah. know i hope that's a a soft critique i'm actually really trying I, i'm classifying this as a pride because it genuinely made me feel proud to read that and see yeah. that published in the times yeah, um, yeah. And, and actually don't think it's as much a provocation as it is like a, a positive message of like i think we can move on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna actually save my response to you because uh, mm. I think in the gay agenda, we will find that I have some similar concerns. <laughs> but I love yes, I, I love, I love, I love this, uh, this pride. Yes, I read that. I read that side Jones piece with great uh, interest and pleasure also. Well, more to come then more to come. I think we can maybe take a break here and then come back after that. And we're back here with our conversation with Chase Strangio. Chase Strangio is a -a one-of-a-kind lawyer and activist, and I gotta tell you all, just one of the most thoughtful and generous and full-hearted people that I've ever met. You know Chase as the Deputy Director for Transgender Justice, the ACLU's LGBT and HIV project, which means that he's been at the forefront for many years advocating and litigating on behalf of queer and trans people. And clearly in recent years, that job has probably gotten a lot tougher. It's also gotten a lot more high profile. So in 2019, Chase represented Amy Stevens, a trans woman fired from her job before the Supreme Court. And in 2020, that court ruled in Bostock versus Clayton County that employment discrimination against gay and trans people is illegal. Chase has also represented trans youth in federal court, fighting state laws, banning gender-affirming care, including in a decisive victory last year in a case about an Arkansas law. And just last month, Chase published an op-ed on the staggering political and legal peril that trans people face in the country today, including why visibility and representation is not going to be what saves us. And, you know, just to say, that was in the New York Times, which I think we all know is not necessarily the easiest place to publish something that actually uh, is so honest. So I have a feeling, I think a lot of us do, that 2024 is going to be a decisive year in the struggle against anti-trans extremists and authoritarians. And for that reason, we're so incredibly lucky to have Chase with us here today to get into what's at stake, how it's going down, also, what we can do about it. So Chase, welcome to Outward. Thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you, Jules and Brian. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's very nice <laughs> and depressing at the same time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah. super happy to be here and, and talk with you both. Yeah, yeah. Maybe co- a conversation for another day and another podcast is like what it means to be a 
trans professional who like has a busy career because the worst things ever um, uh-huh. are supposed yeah. to happen. Oh God! Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I I thought maybe to to start our conversation off, I just kind of want to admit like out loud, you know, to to listeners too that one of the practical challenges of making sense of anti-trans legislation and policies and politics is just actually their sheer number and all the noise they generate. And we're sort of at this point now where every single year shatters the prior year's record for the most anti-trans bills introduced or the most passed. And I really think the math starts to kind of fuzz out. And that's even before you dig into any particular bill or proposal, some of which are just so extreme that I genuinely think it's hard for people to like wrap their heads around or even sometimes believe what's actually happening, especially when a lot of these are now passing and some of them are going into effect. So I'm wondering if a different way to start talking about it would be to ask you instead like about contrast and trends. So I was wondering Mm. like if you look back on 2023, which was a big ass year, um, like what's your big picture sense of kind of what went down last year? And, you know, on the heels of that, like if that's, if that's sort of, where we're coming from here we are just barely into 2024 like in light of last year what are some of your top line concerns for this year yeah i think that's a really important framing because things are staggeringly bad and at the same time there's like a staggering amount of catastrophizing and misinformation out there about what is happening which i don't think is materially helpful for anyone um and so it's good to sort of level set and ground ourselves in sort of the actual devastating things that are going on and then also sort of situate that within the way this is playing out materially in trans people's lives. Um, 2023 was really the worst possible year in in terms of the legislation. And part of that was because there was this message from Republican lawmakers in state legislatures that this was happening no matter what. And the this in that context was mostly the bans on gender affirming care for trans adolescents. And In the prior years, um, you know, in 2021, when when we first saw one of those pass in Arkansas, it was really seen as this extreme outlier. Uh, You know, the governor of Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson, vetoed it. He issued a very, you know, well-done statement about why. And, you know, he was no friend to trans people generally, but really understood that as an extremist measure, a bridge too far. Um, And then, you know, even in 2022, it was very much limited uh, to Alabama passing a bill in the last, you know, days of of session. And they had, had really been pushing that bill for three to three years. And, and then 2023 was remarkably different because we came in and it was just the priority number one in every state legislature across the country. And as someone who's been lobbying in states for you know, eight years up up to 2023 and really understood the idiosyncrasies of state politics, this was really different in the dynamics. And we were getting the message that this was a Republican priority nationwide. It was leadership's priority in almost every single state. There was, quote unquote, nothing that could be done. And that's how we experienced it. Doesn't matter how much money you put in, didn't matter how many Republican lobbyists you had, didn't matter how many calls were coming in from constituents. This was happening. No one was moving. And I actually still don't know exactly who, why, how that was orchestrated as such. Um, But that was very much what happened. And it led to, in essence, half the country banning gender-affirming medical care for trans adolescents. And then a host of other things occurred, you know, against, you know, this backdrop. They sort of snuck in more bathroom bans, uh, particularly for youth in schools. They started to push these so-called women's rights bills, which have a range of material impacts on trans people's life, some more than others, depending on the state. Um, but really, it was the year of the, the medical care ban, and it was, and just, you know, staggering. Just, just for our listeners, that's it was 22 or 23 states that have that on the books now. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's 23, 23. if you include Arizona, which has a sort of narrower right, ban. Right, um, right. And then o- Ohio sort of came in, in actually in 24. And then there's the few states that almost did, but didn't. And I think we're likely to see those this year. Wyoming, South Carolina, West Virginia, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it, it was, you know, the, the loss of healthcare overnight was so profound and it caused obviously upheaval nationally because everyone's trying to get care at clinics out of state who can afford to travel. Those clinics are, some of them, very risk averse, shutting down care for, frankly, from my perspective, no reason to out of state patients. And then people who can't travel are, you know, trying to figure out what to do. People are moving when they can. And so it creates this, you know, just absolute catastrophe nationwide. And then it sets this completely different tone um, in terms of the national conversation, which then leads to a series of legal losses, which have just escalated, really changing not only the political landscape in terms of the laws that have passed, but the doctrinal landscape in terms of how the courts are reckoning with anti-trans discrimination. And that has really only begun, (laughs) um, just begun. I think we're going to see how it, it plays out. That's sort of how we come out of of 2023. I think there was a lot of early 2024 sort of predictions that the next thing on the agenda was care for adults and that we were going to see, you know, widespread attempts to criminalize trans life um, in, you know, public restroom use and, and other contexts. I will say, you know, it's only March. Things can go downhill rapidly. It has not transpired as such. Um, And I think there are some very extreme measures that are being uh, introduced that are getting a lot of attention. I'm not sure those are going to go anywhere. Um, And I think they're very much a part of an atmospheric to, uh, you know, shift the Overton window, make us think that these, you know, sort of more quote unquote run of the mill attacks on our lives, which are themselves extreme, are actually moderate. And so we have to be really mindful of sort of how we engage in the state level politics, what's going on. And when we take a step back and look at 2024, I would say it is not as catastrophic as 2023, um, in part because they accomplished a lot in 2023. And so they're sort of focusing on that and thinking through what are the next steps, right. <laughs> building out the Project 2025, you know, heritage ADF paradigm for a federal election. So I think we should be actually worried about what this means for what's being built while we're sort of, you know, here, like playing whack-a-mole with things that are not a good use of our time. It's clarifying to hear that about 2024. But one of the things that you you point out in that op-ed that Jules mentioned at the top that I think is really important for everyone to remember is that even, you know, even when bills don't pass, they can create a lot of damage, like in the actual, you, you mentioned sort of material lives of people. Can you talk a little bit about, about that, like that environment that even just the idea of some of these extreme bills that may maybe won't pass, but what that does to people? Yeah, I mean, it's just if you think about the climate that we're in, it's sort of like the volume of bills also sort of creates this emboldened sense of rhetorical attack as well. So they they exist alongside the, you know, lawmakers being more transparently hostile and the, you know, the rhetoric in the right becoming more and more anti-trans in its flavor. And so that then, of course, for, you know, for young people, but for all trans people, then creates a sense of nowhere to go no place is safe. Um, And that is, of course, always largely been true for many trans people. um, But this is sort of a new level of that being aired out in in public. Um, And then there's also just the reality of, you know, if you're someone who does have the ability to move, you know, if all of a sudden the state is continually considering efforts to criminalize your restroom use, that that creates a, a psychic sense of unsafety. <laughs> and the reality is, as most people don't know what is lawful and not. And these bathroom bills in particular are designed to heighten, you know, sort of surveillance and policing. Um, and so it ultimately doesn't really matter. If you see a headline that says Arkansas lawmakers you know, attempt to criminalize restroom use, what percentage of the population even knows the difference between something that is considered and ultimately codified into law? Not that much, unfortunately. And so then what ultimately happens is it just emboldens that policing, it emboldens that scrutiny, and then decreases people's psychic sense of safety and actual material safety. And um, and so people leave when they can, and then otherwise people also change their daily practices and patterns of life. And that limits so much, limits job opportunities, limits educational opportunities, limits community opportunities, and that then, you know, sort of feeds this cycle in which then people are not seeing trans people and trans people are not present in people's lives because of the rhetoric about us. Uh, And that I think I've watched happen um, in places where I've spent a lot of time, like Arkansas, where, you know, they passed the gender-affirming care ban, then that generation of 
you know, older adolescents that fighting that that are fighting it, they fight it, they block it for years. But in that process, then adults start being attacked and they're like, well, how am I going to stay here? Um, and so it also pushes people outside of their homes. Mm. I'm so, so grateful for that explanation because I think part of the challenge, like the like crash course in like civics catch up that everyone's having to do these days, like what one of the the key differences you were just helping us understand is like, there's law, you know, in terms of the letter of the law, the you know, what's written down in statutes, but so much of how law is applied and shows up, especially when it has to do with trans people, or it has to do with working class people or sex workers or migrants, or you know, it's often about the administrative state the actual agencies, very often the police, um, that have the actual statutory role of implementation in some way, shape, or form. And also the way that, like, Republicans in particular like to recruit, uh, you know, citizen regular people right to imagine themselves as as upholding some sort of thing that's not really written in the law necessarily right which is like you know we must go after and intimidate and target trans people and scare them and threaten them you know all of these sorts of ways that political violence might not actually be in anywhere in the text right uh, but it could still accompany it they do want to ask like kind of a nerdy question about the texts uh, because you, you you mentioned earlier we got some 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 good old fashioned doctrinal questions coming up. I mean, I do I, I do want to ask this genuinely because I think it is a lot for people to wrap their heads around, and the media will often just talk in really broad brushstrokes about like trans rights and getting this stuff clear and accurate is really important for understanding like the process, but also the stakes and like what we can do about it. So can you just give us a sense of like, what is the sort of lay of the land right now nationally in terms of like, which courts have said, no, you can't ban gender for we care. I'm not which courts, but like, just give us a sense of what that split actually is about. Like what, what supposed right is at stake here as the law thinks of it? And sort of how can we think about where that's going? Um, and if it's going to the Supreme Court? Uh, yeah, no, these are really good and important questions. And in fact, you know, lots of people, myself included, have critiqued the whole notion of rights because rights are just a state created construct. And in fact, in the United States, we don't have a lot of affirmative so called rights. There is no right to health care, for example. So it's not like we're litigating these cases under some health care right because such right would never exist in this country because it would require us to provide health care, which we don't do. And that's the same reason why there's no sort of economic rights in the United States because the courts have continually rejected such an idea because we're such a capitalist country. And an economic right would obviously require some amount of redistribution, which we're fundamentally opposed to. So so rights is, is its own, you know, a lot of time what we mean in the context of rights are sort of statutory rights. What are the rights that come through statutory law? So either congressionally passed law or state laws and sort of your right to be free from discrimination in various contexts. That's what was up uh, at the court in Bostock, which was uh, Title VII, which was a federal law that prohibited in, uh, sex-based discrimination in employment. And the question was, is discrimination against someone for being trans or for being gay, a form of discrimination because of sex. And then the question was, are we covered under that one particular statute? Um, in these cases that we're bringing, challenging these gender-affirming care bans, we're not bringing sort of a right to anything, although actually we have one fundamental rights claim in the case that I'll talk about, but they're largely being litigated as your as equal protection claims. And the Constitution's, you know, 14th Amendment has an equal protection clause, which has in, been interpreted to apply uh, apply sort of this heightened protection for sex discrimination by the government. Because again, the Constitution applies to discrimination by the government. I think that's a lot of times we'll be like, this violates my First Amendment rights, but it's like, you know, a random person saying or doing something or a private company. that That is not First Amendment protected. That is, you know, you get protections under the Constitution from the action of the government. Here, we're saying the government is infringing the equal protection rights, if we want to put it in that rights framework, of trans people by classifying trans people based on our sex and our trans status. Um, and then arguing that under the equal protection law, that the government has to come forward with a sufficiently, uh, you know, important justifica justification for this type of discriminatory line drawing. And that's how equal protection doctrine works. Um, and it's very different, um, than other, than say a first amendment case, which, you know, is what, you know, we often litigate the drag bans under, um, and, you know, sort of I, this idea that you have an affirmative express 
expressive right or you have a right to speak and and not be sort of discriminated against by the government because of the content of your speech. This is very much the line drawn by these bans is a sex line and therefore the government must show something. And that doesn't mean you automatically win. It, you know, it's not even if they agreed that it was a sex line, for example, sex discrimination isn't always illegal by the government. It's just they have to justify it. And so that's sort of the nature of these legal fights is, is it sex discrimination or is it a sex classification? And if so, have they met their burden? So for a while, we were winning all of the cases because the courts agreed with us that this was a sex-based classification and that it discriminated based on sex and trans status. And once you get to that level, then the courts actually look at the evidence and they said, look, And that's what happened in Arkansas. We had a two-week trial. We put on experts. We put on our clients. And the court issued an extensive ruling saying, you know, what they're saying just doesn't hold up. Unfortunately, shortly after that ruling, what ended up happening is a federal appeals court in a different case out of Tennessee and Kentucky, in essence, said, no, 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 these are not sex these aren't sex classifications or tr- even trans status classifications. These are just run-of-the-mill regulations of medical care, which we can defer to the legislature on and you lose. Um, and that set off a cascade of losses at federal appeals courts um, that are, you know, are, are very significant because we won in the lowest court, which is the federal district court. But that doesn't mean anything as a matter of precedent when all of the appeals courts are ruling against us. And in the federal court system, it's federal district courts, circuit courts of appeals, of which there are 12, 11 circuits plus the D.C. circuit. And then there's this other federal circuit, but that's not important for these purposes. And then the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, And so we're litigating most of these cases under federal law in federal court where we can't for any because possibly we've lost, for example, in the Sixth Circuit where Tennessee, Kentucky and Ohio are. We will sue Ohio over their recent ban in state court, which is a totally Mm. parallel system to the federal court system. Um, It insulates the case from Mm. Supreme Court review, for example, Um, because you can only go into the federal courts if you have a federal claim. Um, And so that's how you end up sort of in these, you know, the federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. There has to be a specified you know, set of things that exist in order for you to get into them. Um, And we are facing the very scary prospect of losing many of these cases in these federal appeals courts. And the thing that's in addition to the the catastrophe of the losses themselves, which have allowed these bans to go into effect in a number of states, Mm -hmm. the the way we were losing are losing, (laughs) not were, unfortunately, not past (laughs) us, is catastrophic for trans people more generally because the courts are, in essence, saying this type of line drawing, this type of classifying by the government doesn't warrant any special scrutiny by the courts. And if that's true, then it means legislatures are just really, you know, sort of off, able to do whatever they want when it comes to trans people, because courts are just going to say, well, is it, could, it, could it be rational? Well, that's enough. Um, and that's an incredibly deferential standard. So not only are we fighting back against the losses in the specific context of the gender affirming care bans, but we're fighting back against this idea that discrimination against trans people doesn't warrant any sort of suspect look by by the courts. And, and, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that this, the way that they're doing this is inextricable from other threads of catastrophic doctrinal trends, because what they're saying is Bostock, which we've talked about, the case that says that discriminating against trans people is sex discrimination under the one federal statute that they were interpreting, Title VII, that doesn't apply here because this is the Constitution. That's not a very persuasive argument, but courts are buying it. And instead, they're saying, you know what does control here? Dobbs. And the reason Mm. why, and Dobbs is the case overturning Roe v. Wade, and there's a throwaway paragraph from Alito in Dobbs. This is getting very into the weeds, but I'm just going to do it because I (laughs) think it's really important. Dobbs was not an equality case. It was a case, a fundamental rights case. Abortion cases were litigated under the idea that there's a fundamental right to privacy, which encompasses the right to abortion. And so the question in Dobbs was, is the was the court's prior, you know, jurisprudence around this fundamental right correct, or are they going to overturn it? The majority of the opinion looks at the development of the fundamental right jurisprudence. There is one paragraph that says, 
Some amiki, which are friends of the court, are arguing that this gets this elevated look because it is sex discrimination. Hmm. And Alito writes this paragraph that in essence says it is not sex discrimination to dis- to classify based on a medical procedure that only one sex can undergo. And this is a reanimation of an old terrible case called the Godoldig, in which the court mm. said pregnancy discrimination is not sex discrimination. Oh my God. And huh. so they're well. using these bad, bad pregnancy and abortion cases to say only biological, quote unquote, females can take testosterone to transition. Therefore, it is a it is a medical procedure that only one sex can undergo, wow. and okay. therefore it's just like abortion, and you lose. So, the, and they're they're sort of beefing up this Dobbs rhetoric and doctrine in order to not just hurt trans people, but we know they're going to then redeploy it to say, oh, and guess what? No contraception because this is yeah. just a medical procedure that only one sex can undergo. Getting an IUD, mm-hmm. um, and so if you think about all the ways this could come back to harm people, it's very profound. And this is sort of what they're doing in our cases. Wow. Wow. No, I'm (laughs) so glad you (laughs) took us all the way down to that paragraph because that kind of explains so much, right? It's like, I think the thing that is challenging is that like law, you know, law is opaque and, um, and specialized in and of itself. But then we're living in a period where courts are doing are like moving in incredibly political directions that really break <laughs> from right legal precedent and tradition, and so it can, it's like yeah. twice as confusing, I think, um, for for people who don't have you know, which is most people who you know who don't have a law school degree to like wrap our heads around what's going on. So I, I really appreciate you like outlining that in great detail. You know, I I don't want to boil that all down to something, but but I'm curious if this is like a good way of phrasing it, mm. you know, in case this is helpful for listeners too. Like in terms of this equal protection argument, right? Um would one way to understand this very broadly be like what you were just saying, right? It's like, okay, I take estrogen, right? It's the exact same estrogen that my mom could be prescribed, right? It, during menopause. Mm-hmm. Not saying she is, not trying to out my mom, but, um, <laughs> um, but like, right, it's like the same thing. Obviously, it's coded differently by insurance, mm-hmm, right? The doctors right. say it's for a different purpose, as if it's magical when I do it, right? That's sure. That's a regulatory difference, right? But 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 basically, the the law could say like, well, Jules, you're not allowed to take the same estrogen as your mom because you're trans, right? Would be the argument, um, you know, would be the way we would would bring a case like that. But these courts are saying, no, 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 it has nothing to do with sex at all. It's just a medical procedure. And actually, thanks to this old case law on pregnancy, right, and other forms of rationalizing the oppression of of women and pregnant people, like, it doesn't matter. The the fact that, you know, uh, we've decided it's different when you do it when you're trans, and it doesn't matter that it's the same hormones that that other women take is that does that i just wanted to know see if i was like yeah because we tried very much to say look you take like someone designated male at birth can't Mm -hmm. take estrogen to affirm a female identity but someone designated female at birth can that's but for sex it's sex discrimination that should be the end of the story of course we're really like yep feels like sex discrimination and then (laughs) as this sort of heightened climate they're like No, it's actually not because the purpose is different. It's the medical procedure. uh, And because of Dobbs and Godoldig, in essence, because of our longstanding horrible way of regulating pregnancy um, and reproductive autonomy, we have a way in our legal cases to tell you why you lose. And it's actually not the sex discrimination you're claiming. We try, and here's the other really challenging thing is we then want to say, no, 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 that's wrong. But we can't say, you know, you can't go to court and say Dobbs is wrong because you'll lose. You have, you know, Mm -hmm. so you have to say why Dobbs is different. But as a matter of like a person who cares about abortion, I don't want to legitimize the doctrine in Dobbs. I don't want to be like, unlike in abortion where sex has nothing to do with it because i'm like obviously i don't believe that Mm. um (laughs) you know and and the the, the reason why it's different is because you just want to be like because you were wrong there but you're trapped like you are trapped in the paradigm of law you're trapped in the language of law if your job is what mine is is to litigate and go to court and say given what the law already says i still win um and that's one 
a perfectly clear example of why the law is the worst place to go for movement and transformative change. It in, hmm. it requires mm-hmm. you every single time to either p- exclude someone or sort of like preemptively distance yourself from someone. So it is it is anti solidarity at its core, based on how it operates and the narratives you are required to tell, and therefore are reifying <laughs> in to existence. So that is is sort of, to me, another lesson why, yes, I believe in using law to reduce harm. I will continue to go to court, try to push back the state Mm. from doing all of these bad things. But we, we absolutely can't turn to the law affirmatively as the place where we expect to find any liberation, because that's just not what law is for. Yeah. Well, it's time for a short break, but when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Chase Strangio. All right, that is about it for the show this week. But before we go, we've got your usual updates to the gay agenda, and we're pleased today to be joined by Chase to share some. Chase, what do you got? So I think I have, I I will admit, I don't read a lot because I read a lot of law and I don't want to recommend law, but I have been reading um, Travis Alabanza's None of the Above. Mm, So I recommend Travis's book. Um, I am not all the way through, but it's just a nice thing to just like come back to at the end of the day when I'm in law, which is very much the opposite of law. Um, And then the other thing I'll say is that I, my kid and I have been doing a sort of like assessment of Disney villain queerness. Ooh, uh, that's um, and yeah, it's really fun. So, uh, so, but we just watched Cruella um, mm. and it was a fun, it was a fun rewatch. I had seen it actually, but it just, to me, that's like a very gay mm-hmm. queer. Well, and where did, film. where did Cruella, you know, Fall on the, come it, in on your, yeah. on your ad hoc I mean, very high. Yeah. I think high. Yeah. I think ultimately, like it's the ultimate queer story. Yeah, she's a good one. Um, I am She's, forever yeah. trying to live up to that kind of femininity. Let me tell you, yeah, <laughs> I need to be I mean, more devious. <laughs> so I think um, I recommend I recommend Corella all around. Ooh, very good gay agenda items. Beautiful, thank you, Chase. All right, Jules, what do you have for the gay agenda this uh, week? Well, I just have one sort of postscript to this um, multi-episode conversation we've been having about all of us strangers. <laughs> um, there's a, a recent episode of one of my absolute favorite podcasts, Nympho Wars, hosted by the unbelievably funny uh, Theta Hamill and Macy Rodman. You know, I highly recommend you know going to listening to the latest iteration of their podcast in general, which these days is called KNFW Long Haul Trucker Radio for the Flyover <laughs> Country, where they do a radio <laughs> show for truckers driving across America's heartland as two hilarious transsexual women. Anyways, there's a lot of satire and parody going on, and in in their latest episode, there, which is called KNFW Live from New York, it's Josh Brolin. <laughs> there's a long, long, long subplot uh, in this episode. Said, which connects and includes the the two of them, Hamill and Rodman, basically creating their own version, parody version of of all of us strangers. That's called uh, all of them gays, <laughs> uh, and you know. There's a lot going on there. And I just, I think it's hilarious. I think it's probably um, a lot more successful and smarter than than I could have been in reacting to the film uh. and like actually talking <laughs> about some of these kinds of, like genuinely talking about some of these interesting questions and friction points between gay men's experiences and trans women's experiences um, and the different kinds of affects that are allowed, like woundedness versus like confidence versus satire, being funny versus being raw and vulnerable vulnerable and kind of like what kinds of people h- how easy it is for different kinds of people to embrace those mm, those kinds of mm, modes mm. in public and what's beautiful about KNFW is like they're not going to sit down and say it all to you in a boring way like I just did they're going to do it act it out in hilarious ways so you know just in general I always want to shout out Nympho Wars because I think Macy and Theta are like two of the most talented trans women um, in the world. And if you want to laugh and probably be outraged uh, or like titillated, I mean, it's like a very raunchy show. So like, don't listen to it unless you're like totally down for that. But I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, So that's the latest episode of Nympho Wars, the podcast uh, titled KNFW Live from New York. It's Josh Brolin. (laughs) 
<laughs> you can send send all your uh, you know flustered responses directly to me. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, I'm gonna go listen to that immediately after this. That that sounds so amazing. Um, uh, Brian, what have you got? I know you you previewed you had some some gay agenda continuity with our pride and provocation. I did. I t- well, I teased it, and I think we were we we're sort of in solidarity because uh, I wanted I wanted to speak about RuPaul's memoir, but specifically the sort of the discourse around it generally. That's my recommendation: is is go read the discourse. Don't read the memoir. Maybe do read the memoir. I don't know. I won't be reading it, but uh, but I, I do think it's worth reading the discourse because it's very fascinating. Um, so you mentioned the Syed Jones piece, uh, the review that that was great. I'm gonna uh, do another quote from that that I just loved, uh, describing Rue as a, quote, a striver high on his own supply who tries to spin his story as empathetic wisdom draped in Instagram-ready captions. Fantastic line. The other thing I would read and recommend Ooh. is uh, the Ronan Farrow profile of RuPaul in The New Yorker that came out as part of this, you know, the press push that's happening right now. Very interesting piece. You know, it's worth remembering that Ronan Farrow was a host, on, or a, rather a judge, I'm sorry, on Drag Race a few times, I think two times in the past. So he's a bit of a fan. But what comes out in this profile is just this really weird and lonely guy who, and this is in the lead of the piece, is building a bunker on his Wyoming fracking ranch to ride out the coming civil oh. war. So uh, so that oh. that's, uh, that's what Rue's up up to you mm-hmm. uh-huh um so that's interesting also uh worth looking at um if you don't follow lady bunny the the famous drag queen on instagram who is ostensibly rupaul's friend uh she is really leveling some interesting mm-hmm. criticisms and uh spilling a little bit of tea you might say uh a, on there, Ooh. getting lost in the comment sections where people are really hashing it out one pushback um sort of uh, theme that I've seen that I think is worth thinking about is the idea that sort of Rue as a black man is receiving more criticism and hostility than maybe he deserves and maybe a white gay man might might not. So, you know, worth taking that point, thinking about it. a lot of interesting thought happening there. But like you, Jules, like in, as you were describing in your uh, Pride and Provocation, I've been a Rue skeptic for a long time, specifically since I saw him give this really kind of horrifying interview at the New York Public Library many years ago, where he really yeah. got into this troubling, new age, sort of narcissistic, self-centered politic that he has. Mm-hmm. He really he really articulated it there, and it kind of freaked me out ever since. And you, and, and you see it in san- more sanitized ways on the show and elsewhere, and I think in this book. So, I, mm-hmm. so it's interesting to me to see this reckoning sort of happening now around the memoir and again recommendations just kind of go read up on it because people are saying a lot of interesting things uh specifically that ronan farrow piece and the side jones review and i'm sure there'll be others uh going forward fun little moment to follow especially alongside if, if you're watching yeah. uh drag race season 16 uh which i was but have quit so um <laughs> that's <laughs> no it's a it's a it's a bigger moment for mm-hmm, reflection mm-hmm. and just like you know maybe my top line takeaway from this as always is Goodness, extreme wealth really <laughs> is an unhealthy state. And uh, that's why I support a politics in which no one to has build a the bunker. money to build an underground bunker in Wyoming where they're also fracking. Yeah. Hmm. Just some food mm-hmm. for thought. Well, <laughs> that, that I think brings us to the end of this episode. But please, as always, I think we've given you uh, a lot of places to, to do to send us some feedback. So if you got some feedback, you have some topic ideas, you can always shoot us an email over at outwardpodcast at slate.com. You can reach out to us via Facebook or X uh, at Slate Outward. And just remember, we always want um, uh, your your advice questions and, and other things we can kind of hold on to when we when we do some advice episodes. So always trying to, to solicit that. Come to us uh, with your questions, not just your comments. And uh, a reminder, if you if you join Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Working, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. If you're interested, you can go to slate.com slash Outward Plus. Our show was produced by the fabulous Palace Shaw. Mm-hmm. If you like Outward, please subscribe in your podcast app. Tell your friends about it and rate and review the show so others can find it. But in the meantime, bye, Brian. Bye, Jules. Bye.
I'll stay really, really extra, super duper gay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>